Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing today? Excellent. Lisa is awesome. Thank you, back my. <laughs> All right, so uh, who here uses Django so we get a good feel? And who here deploys Django applications on a regular basis? Oh, I'm surprised they handed it down. All right. Anyway, um, so I'm here from Heroku, and I'm going to give you a quick little uh, Heroku 101. Uh, just going to give you a good, brief overview of what it is and how awesome it is. And, uh, the goal of this is to spark lots of little questions, so feel free to interrupt me at any time, because uh, if you don't, we'll be done in 20 minutes. Otherwise, the, the goal is for everyone to be interrupting and asking crazy questions all the time. So, does anyone have any questions so far? <laughs> <laughs> all right, excellent. So, uh, Heroku is a platform as a service for several different programming languages. By default, we support Ruby, Python, Java, Scala, Clojure, Node.js, and as you saw earlier, Logo, which is the best one. But fortunately, that's not our uh, most popular language, but we're working on it. <laughs> um, before I begin, we, have, we are owned by Salesforce, which is a publicly traded company, so please do not make any uh, train decisions based on the contents of my talk. <laughs> I was actually told that this isn't necessary anymore because of some law to change, but it, it's fun. So. <laughs> Anyway, I guess Akamai should have the same thing, really. Are they both Anyway, so um, you hear these terms all the time uh, when you're dealing with like you know Web 2.0 people and these hacker news style organizations, uh, Y Combinator companies, and uh, they're kind of confusing. You need to know which ones are which. Um, so there's software as a service, there's infrastructure as a service. And there is platform as a service. And it's easy to get these things confused or just kind of group them all as one unit. And uh, what Heroku is, is a platform as a service. And we get into what each of those things are. So a SaaS is um, it's for software users, basically. It has a lot of features and transparent updates. These are tools like uh, Basecamp. Uh, you could consider Facebook, I think, a software as a service. It's usually like a hosted piece of software that's usually running in a web browser where you connect to with some kind of client. And uh, you know all the actual business logic is occurring. Something <coughs> it's not happening on your machine. And if you know they want to update, they want to change things, uh, that all happens remotely, and you don't have to worry about it as a user, which is great. Uh, you know you don't have to like update your Facebook. Well, in my case, on my iOS, uh, on my iPhone, I have to update the Facebook app every couple of weeks. But ideally, <laughs> you wouldn't have to do that. You know it would be this thing that kind of everything's happening on the server. Um, so this. It, as the progression of the different uh, service providers has kind of gone over the years, we have to compare software as a service kind of as, um, let's say, you, when you're watching videos back in the day, you like had a you had DVD, or say VHS tapes, right? Um, and you had Blockbuster. So you go and you show up to Blockbuster. Like you have to go and prepare a bunch of stuff, right? You go and you get a, a machine that you're hooked up uh, at home, you know, a, a VHS device, or they call it, it? VCR. VCR. <laughs> Man, it's a black foot out. <laughs> Please be kind to one. Exactly, so you have to do all this work, right? You get the device and you set it up, and then you have to, uh, uh, you know, and you go and you, you go get the, D or the, <laughs> the VHS, and you, you know, bring it back, you have to rewind it, and there's all this work that's involved in using it. Um, and then you have infrastructure as a service. And this is for ops people and on-demand machines, basically. So if you're going to be working at a company, you are going to be setting, you can, instead of having like buy all this hardware like you used to have to do, like you did with these like VHS systems, you have to go buy servers and set them up in your data center, uh, you know, get purchase orders and get your manager to sign off, and it's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, and like having agreements with ISPs. Um, you can use infrastructure as a service where you just, uh, you know, there's an API you call, and then there's a bunch of virtual machines available that you can use, and you don't actually have to be interacting with the, the mechanics behind that anymore. And that's similar to what uh, Netflix basically is, right? Where you just have, you say, okay, I want, I want these DVDs, and then they send them to you in the mail, and it shows up. Then you have platform as a service, and this is basically for developers. Um, you get transparent updates just like you do a software as a service, but instead of it being for you know, the software, it's actually happening system level. Um, so ideally, you don't have to think about servers anymore, and that's more like you know, Netflix instant streaming, <coughs> where you know you just go on and you watch the, the things. It doesn't matter what device you're using. Uh, you know you don't have to worry about all the mechanics behind what they're doing to, to stream that to you. You're just using it. Unless you're back of course, say 
got to deal with it all the time. So. <laughs> yes? Where in the spectrum was something like AWS bought? AWS is an infrastructure as a service, yeah. as well as uh, Rackspace, uh, Google, Compute Cloud, I think is the new one that's doing that. Uh, those are the, you know, you're going to be using those to build your own platforms, basically. Uh, so Heroku, again, is a platform as a service. And I'm a Python developer. Python is the best. We're going to ignore all these other languages except for Logo. And uh, <laughs> then we're going to get into the Python side of things. I'm going to show you how awesome it is. So hopefully the demigods will have mercy. We're going to be doing a lot of uh, interactive stuff here with the internet, so hopefully it'll work. It is Akamai, so hopefully it'll work pretty well. I assume it should have good Wi-Fi. Um, let's start this start here. So can everybody see the text all right? Good? All right. So um, basically what I have here is a simple little Django app that I downloaded off GitHub. You know, this is a, kind of the basic workflow. You, you get a repo, download it, you clone it, and then you can uh, run these simple commands and get started locally. And that's what I'm going to do. So what's the first thing you do? Anybody? Come on. Is there a very interactive? Git clone. Virtual app? Virtual app? Yes, correct. So I already have one made because I was afraid of the internet. Should we make a new one? Let's make a new one. <coughs> All right. So I have a new virtual app. Let me activate it. And we're in the directory with uh, the repo. So the first thing we do is we're going to take a look at our requirements file. <coughs> this has a list of all the dependencies of the application, fairly standard stuff. And we're going to pip install them. Shouldn't be joking because a lot of people actually don't use virtual on a regular basis. So if you, have, if you want to know what that is, feel free to ask. Yes. So if it was well, that's like just a dash r afterwards requirements. Yeah. Basically, what that does is instead of you entering in each one at a time, it gives it a list and it installs them all at the same time, cool. which saves a, a lot of time. It's cool. Yeah. Except for the trying to navigate, figure it out from the beginning. Their starting story isn't too good. I agree. I had something that I worked pretty hard to, to help. I have a project called um, Python Guide. Yep. Which uh, I guess here at the other meetup was uh, discussed. But the goal of this is to make kind of all those things easy to do. Uh, so if you like go to the Python installation guide, uh, it actually tells you how to install pip um, properly from the beginning. And I have, if you have any questions about how to use virtual web, there's a, yeah, so I have like a whole guide into virtual web and uh, how to use it basically. So. Useful. And it also works fine on Windows, which a lot of people don't know. Yes? Since you were asking for comments, I just did all this for the first time today. And the mm -hmm. tricky part was getting uh, MySQL to work under virtual end. Yeah, MySQL is crazy. That was the hard part. Everything else was right out of the box. You should use Postgres instead. <laughs> <laughs> what was the, uh, were you on a Mac? Or? I was on uh, Ubuntu. Okay. Yeah, well, so, yeah, that is a different role. Because uh, normally the app workflow app. Is, is app get install Python and MySQL, right? Right. Yeah, when instead of doing it in the virtual app, which is um, a problem. Yes? If you haven't been using virtual app, is it basically like pretty simple to, like you have <coughs> existing code, you just create virtual app and then just import everything again? Yes. just work in that? Uh, basically what it does is, uh, when you have like a system Python where you have all these packages installed into, uh, it has a site packages directory where it sticks all that stuff. And um, virtual end basically ignores that one. It has its own. Okay. So you can, uh, it, it's totally isolated. So you can have conflicting versions in different virtual ends and each project can be like from a clean slate. Because right. it's easy, like if there's a, a project that you use all the time, you can forget that it's not in the standard library. And then uh, when you go share your code with someone else, you know, it won't import. And uh, virtual is really good for that. Yeah. And it, yeah, I recommend it. And it, like, we just set up a new one just right now. So it's how simple it is. It's not very difficult. Um, so the first thing you do is install the dependencies. And then we can try to run our manage.py. And hopefully uh, everything will work. Let's do run server. It should run, and then when we hit it, it will fail if everything is working properly because we didn't sync our database. All right, we have a nice template syntax error. That's good. 
So the next thing you do is you uh, run manage.pysyncdb, <coughs> tell it to connect to the database, and uh, do all the things. Yeah, you know, it'll create the database and the default users and stuff like that. If you guys, oh, well, I get that. Right, no. They don't even super users. <coughs> yeah, and as we load it, every fault connected on server again. And, ta da! Alright, so now we have a simple to do app that is running and it's hitting my, uh, the local Postgres database. Um, yeah, we can add new tasks. So I'll do talk or, or demo Heroku at is it Boston Django or Django Boston? I don't even know. I yeah, so I know it's different. It's the opposite <laughs> of the other one, of the Python one. Django Boston. All right, and then you can complete it or delete it. Whatever. Very simple app. Um, pretty straightforward. This stuff is actually happening in the database. So, any questions so far? So let's go to let's go back here to the slides. So when you're using Heroku, <coughs> basically what happens is we just run any process that you tell us to run. It's very simple. We don't have any kind of like complicated um, interface for to define what your application is or any like certain way that it has to be structured. Uh, we're not using like a subset of Python. We're using like real Python, with real processes, and we just run exactly what you tell us to and everything works. So the things that we do locally, you can do on us, and everything works fine. And uh, just like here, we did these are the steps that we took locally to set up our Python environment. Um, when you do it on Heroku, it's the exact same thing. There's no, there's no difference. It's a developer and production parity, basically. And I will set up a new project now for you to see. So give me just a second here. Got to delete that one. Here, try to get all the all the flags are different for every single uh, command. All right, cool. So um, to create a new Heroku app, basically, you or to extend Heroku your code, what you do is you get uh, just like we did to get the code and run it locally, and that's what most developers use on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, basically, what you do is you create a new app and it creates a new Git uh, remote that you can push the code to, and it'll build it. So do now. So you Heroku create, which is a, which is a uh, this is a thing you can install Heroku. It's like a uh, it's called Tool Belt. It's available on toolbelt.heroku.com. It's like a little PNG installer. It's real simple. And it gives you some commands, including this Heroku one, which is basically you know your interactions with the platform all happen on the command line. So you do Heroku create, and you have a new app name because we didn't provide one. This one is called uh, Ancient Wildwood. 8582. <laughs> yeah, we're very uh, snickety about our, our branding. So it's, uh, it's pretty funny. When we need to add new words, there's a very deep philosophical conversations that happen internally. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, that's not a useful name. So I'll change it to rename Boston Django. All right. So now it's bostondjango.perkwood.com. And when we go there, there's not going to be anything because we didn't do anything yet. We just created, created the slot to push the application to, basically. All right, welcome to your new app. So this is, a, this is your little home for your new application. And what we're going to do is we're going to push our code up, just like you want to get up. So for the Heroku rename, do you have to have like special admin privileges, or could I just try to rename it to something that doesn't already exist? As long as it doesn't already exist. Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. We have a few reserved names in like admin and stuff like that, but yeah, you can name it anything um, you need to, as long as it's not taken. So what's happening here now is Heroku is receiving your code. Yeah, I notice that there's a requirements.txt file, which means that it's a Python app. Because um, that's what Python apps normally have in their in the repository, and it's doing the exact same thing that we did locally. So it's setting up Python, it's installing pip in virtual env, um, and then it's going to do pip install r on that requirements file. And it's running the same commands that we ran locally. And it's like a PG, which is doing all this C extensions. So you see that's 
Um, it's the extension building basically. It's make and GCC, uh, which is unfortunate. It's something that drives me crazy. And the thing is, GCC does this all the standard out instead of standard error, so you can't like clean it up very easily because there could be important information in there. But um, it's just it's the name of the game when it comes to C extensions. Or no, I hate C extensions. Any questions so far? Uh, well, I have a broader question, which is just, uh, or, as the talk goes on, can you compare and contrast to, uh, say, Google App Engine? Mm -hmm. So Google App Engine um, is very different uh, in, in many, many ways. Okay. Um, <coughs> they, they sort of control your compiler, control your APIs, and that sort of thing. Do you guys do any of that? And control it. They'll like, make, make, actually do like URL level permissions and stuff like that, like they do? Uh, I think, sure, you, sure, I think or, or. you, like in App Engine, you can control the request per second per per path, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. But yeah. for example, opening up file is a big, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so that's the the biggest difference yeah. between us and App Engine. App Engine makes it so, if, from what I understand, you actually don't have access to um, sockets or files or threads right. they, they just or sub processes or other things that everyone uses to build applications. <laughs> um, and uh, we don't restrict any of that. Do you, do you feel like talking about how? Or yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. But the short answer is LXC containers. Uh, so we do system level isolation instead of language level sandboxing like they do. And I, I, I was really against what they were doing for a long time because it just seemed so wrong. And then I realized that when they were building App Engine, uh, virtualization wasn't really like a popular thing yet. Um, and that, I think that changes a lot of things. So um, I learned a little bit about what Salesforce does, because we're like a subsidiary of them. And they have a similar thing. They have like this weird Java subset language for writing code on their platform. And again, it predates virtualization. So it's not really Java. You know, it's like half Java. Just like uh, App Engine is only like half Python. They, you know, you keep have only half the standard libraries there. They remove. Like this, I think sys or system is gone. Like, it's ridiculous. Yeah, it's. I don't know what's going on here. Whatever internet got killed. Test something here. So, actually, this is sort of a, so. Uh, can you run like pop or ps? Or yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> I don't know. There's something going on here. Let's see here. Silence. <laughs> All right, cool. So I, I guess there was a probably a drop packet or something of the Wi-Fi here. So the app is now running, and our pip install thing works. <coughs> so I will run Heroku open, or hit the URL that I already have open. So let's do that. Oops, that's not right. No, there we go. Excellent. So we have the exact same behavior we had locally. We push the app up, and now it's running, and it's having a, a syntax error because the database that we want to interact with doesn't exist. There's no magic. You know, it's doing exactly what we told it to do. So um, just like locally, what we did is we ran manage.py syncdb. We can do that on Heroku. And we do, uh, to do that, we, type, we have this command called Heroku run. And Heroku run is really cool because it basically um, will run anything you tell it to. So I can do Heroku run ls, for example. And basically what it's doing is it's going out, we have like a tarball that is your application, it's portable. Uh, it's actually taking a new instance of your application, this is grabbing it and it's running it in the environment, and running that one command and get, getting rid of it forever. So I just did ls and that happened and that worked. So I could do, you know, oh my god. All right. That shouldn't hurt. What am I doing now? No, yeah, absolutely fine. Oh, did I actually get hang on? <laughs> That's weird. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah. If I was using a, a flag of the actual command line. So uh, you know, this is just gonna run and it's gonna delete all the files. Uh, which you would never want to do in production, right? That'd be like the worst thing ever. But everything's still running. See? It still is fine with our terrible error, because 
it is a totally isolated environment. So you know, when you're intended to run something that's taking a new copy of the code, running it, getting, getting rid of it, so there's no uh, persistence on the disk layer at all, which is important for building services at scale. Now, if you want to have 10 different web servers running, if you're relying on disk persistence locally, then you can have a lot of uh, crazy things. So we'll run um, Python app manage.py sync db. And the exact same thing that happened locally will happen except for it's running in on Heroku in an isolated environment, which we call the dyno. I'll see if that worked. And now when you load this up, um, you have a nice little uh, to do app. And you guys can hit it right now. It's on the internet. Anyone can see it. It was really easy. I encourage you to put silly things in it. If you don't, I'm going to wait. This is boston django.herokuhub.com. So I can do uh, lines. Excellent. You guys are slow. Come on. There we go. Hey. Excellent. <laughs> Yeah. Any questions so far? Wait, so what, what did you do that made it persist? What Nothing did you persisted. Do? So what happened was, basically, uh, the, disk, the disk changes are persistent. Uh, but what we're doing is we're interacting with the database, which is an external resource, uh, which I'll get into a little bit more of the details in a bit. But um, basically, the database is considered an external resource. Um, which is why like SyncDB didn't run automatically, basically. So, <coughs> back to the presentation here. So, you know, the same command that we used to, to run the server locally, we did that manage.py run server, right, is the exact same thing as we're running remotely. And the way that you define that is you have this file called a proc file in uh, your repository. And basically it's this little format that we built that allows you to define um, the processes that comprise your application. And it's really useful outside of us. I use it for everything uh, long before I started using your Roku. Because you can, you know, you have a line here for web. This is the command to run the web server. You can have uh, like 10 lines. And, you know, you have Accelerate server or SMTP client, and, you know, all these different processes that comprise your app. And then we come have this little command line tool called Formant. And you run Formant start. And basically it takes all those things and it runs them all locally for you. And it puts all the standard app into one thing. So if you do celery at all with Django, uh, something that happens to me a lot is you'll have like four tabs open, one with each, like you know, one with celery running, one with server running, one with like celery beat. Uh, and this like makes that totally unnecessary, basically, which is great. Is there a reason to use prog file over like uh, fabric or something like that? To... Uh, they serve different purposes, basically. You could use Fabric to do manage.py start, but I, that's not really what it's designed for. Right. Yeah. But you could just tell Foreman to run Fabric start, and it would do the same thing. Right. Yeah. And I, it's a very simple format. Like It doesn't actually support comments or anything. So ideally, you could parse it and use it in right. tool. Someone ported, uh, it's written in Ruby, but it's um, like someone ported Python. It's like 20 lines. It's pretty cool. I saw a question. Yeah, is that talk about something you built beforehand, or is it something that happened when you did the push? No, no, this is it's just in the repository. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I, I do this with all my projects now, though. So if you like look at um, HTTP bin is a project that I run, and um, it run, does run on Heroku, but even if it didn't, um, I, I use a proc file, and it's, it does a torrent unicorn, and it's, it's pretty nice. I think I'll show you a more complicated one if you give me a second. I have so many things I started and never finished. I don't even see my private stuff. No. <laughs> Let me think for a second. What was it called? What was it called? What was it called? I wrote one before oh, I should have it. Oh, it was called Build Pack Party. So I have so many repos that I actually have to I have an archive account that I move them over to so to keep my main one clean. Oh, Winchip, sorry, that was perfect. I think this one has a couple lines in it. A lot of people don't understand how the multi-line thing works. Like, yeah, I just write simple services, that's no problem. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, I just take the word for it. There we go. The 
take us the last couple of lines. There you go. Well, <laughs> 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 you get the point, right? Like this is what something that's very practical to use. Um, so it has a, a server and then salary. Uh, yeah, very simple. And the cool part about this is, well, give me one second here. Now let's keep doing the demo. Um, so the cool thing is with this is when you have different uh, processes defined this way and they're all isolated from one another, like this is a web process and this is a celery process, um, you can scale them separately basically. So instead of having your application be one unit that like, you know, goes up and down with more servers if you need them, you can have, if you have like, a lot of web traffic one day and no background jobs, you can have more web processes uh, and not more celery workers. It's pretty cool. So, um, let me show you what's going on with our app now, our to-do app. We should have lots and lots of tasks. Excellent. Oh, you guys are good. Everybody loves kids. Awesome. <laughs> um, so, you know, we just got to the front page of Hacker News, real popular. You know, we get slammed. Oh, no. What do we do? First thing you want to do is look at your logs to see what's going on. There's a command called Roku Logs. And basically what it does is it's going to take the standard output of all your processes and and put them all into one location that you can look through and search and rep and stuff like that. Uh, so here is, we only have one process running, and then we have the Heroku router that uh, is sending things over. So, let me see the color. Okay. Um, so here's a request coming in. Uh, get me, you know, it's going to the custom CSS. It's getting to 404. Because <laughs> the application that I wrote sucks. But uh, <laughs> here we go. Get, so it's pretty simple what's happening there. Uh, and I can tell it's a tail of the logs. And then if you guys hit the website, it will show up as, as it happens. There you go. So if I refresh, oops. there you go. So it's coming through as it's happening. It's a little clear. And so it'll hit, and it'll show up. There you go. It's pretty cool. But again, it's only happening in one web process. So like we're getting slammed right now. How is the website going to handle all the stress? Um, we have a cool thing called Heroku Scale. So do PS, it'll show us uh, the number of processes we currently have running. Uh, we, by default, it just runs one of the web process. It's been up for 11 minutes. <coughs> and I can tell it. Because what it's doing is it takes the application, it's building it, and I, like I said, it makes that like tarball-like thing of your app, which is kind of sitting somewhere. Uh, we can just take and run, you know, a given number of versions of your website if you want, or of your app. So I can run 10 of them. Oops. Web equals 10. Now suddenly, there's 10, 10 instances of your application. And each of these things have uh, 5, 12 megs of RAM. Basically, it's like a, a, a VPS. Uh, doing that on EC2 or on Rackspace or something would take a lot of engineering and take a while. You could like take the system and clone the whole thing and replicate it. Um, then like updating it is a pain. Uh, this like just two seconds. So now we run the PS again, and there's ten versions of the application running. So so if you have multiple processes, can you just could you just scale your web processes and not scale your yes or whatever? App? Yeah. So I said scale web equals ten. So it's only scaling the web ones. So you can do only Celery or any, like you've got your web scraper that's running in the process, you can tell it to run a thousand of those. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. And uh, let me do the logs again. So now um, everything gets automatically load balanced as well. So, there's all the startup stuff. So as you guys hit this, or as I hit it, hit it a couple times. Wasn't there that rap genius thing about yeah. Roku's load balance so changes? The, the thing with that was that they were using the old version of Heroku, basically, uh, and it was designed for Rails, which is uh, um, not concurrent. Uh -huh. basically. So if you're using a concurrent uh, server, then it's, you don't have to worry about that. But um, right now we're actually using a non-concurrent server because we're using the worst server ever, which is the uh, the um, manage.py run server, which you shouldn't use. So let's fix that, actually. Well, first. I'll finish this. Um, so you can see here, these things are automatically getting load balanced. We have web.10, web.2, web.7. It's, uh, it's randomly distributed into all of them. Yes? Are these hitting the same database? They are. OK. Yes. So the database typically scales uh, horizontally, so, or vertically, not horizontally. Yeah. Um, let's see here. 
So uh, we're going to switch to GNR Barn. So the workflow normally is you do it locally first. So we're going to install GNR Barn. And then we will update our requirements file. Oops. It freeze requirements. And then, there we go. All right, cool. Um, we'll update our proc file. So, nice to hear what the Django one is. I think it wants to know the settings file. Yeah, so let me try it locally. Dreamcore Django app settings. Cool. Failed to boot. Let me try. And now we'll push that up. Does so anyone have any questions on why like GNCorn is better than Run Server? Okay. So, go sure. ahead. Why is it better than Run Server? Uh, because Run Server is the worst server ever. Basically, <laughs> uh, it's actually gotten a lot better, and it's getting better still. But it's not a good thing. Uh, basically, G uh, GNCorn is a production-ready web server. It handles a lot more scenarios and corner um, cases that Manage.py Run Server does not. And Run Server on its own does, I think, only handles one connection at a time. So. If someone's even like loading a single page on your website, they're probably going to be sending in, like five requests with the CSS and stuff, and that's going to be they're all going to be blocking, waiting. They can't handle it one at a time, which is terrible. It's like the most inefficient thing you could possibly do. So um, we're going to push. It doesn't like me today. Here we go. So we're going to push the master branch up again, and instead of having to build everything like you did last time. Um, and it's cached, just like it is locally, basically. So it's only going to install that one thing. And I'll look at here. Yep. So it's installing GeoCorn. Because that was added. And uh, now we're using a serious server to put it off. And hopefully I use the right syntax in my proc file. <laughs> we'll find out in a second here. <coughs> And basically what's going to happen now is all of those processes, as soon as it's done, um, are going to be restarted uh, automatically, all 10 of them. Come on. I blame the internet. There you go. So uh, when, when is certain process? When these processes get restarted, is there, like, let's say I've created a debugging problem and I want to go back and find out that, oh, that happened because this guy got bounced at this topic, right? Is, uh, yeah. Uh, is that all logged too? Or well, if, if, as much as you decide to log, it's logged. So everything that's in standard out is in that, is in that uh, log okay. system, basically. So you should have good logs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so load it and hopefully it's running. Sweet, it is. All right, so now we're using Geocorn. Which is awesome, because junior coins are better. <laughs> this is a boot. There we go. Oh, we need to have this thing. It will let me do command R. There we go. Nice and quick now. See? It's way better. Is it the question? Yes. So what happens to applications in this intermediate period when you're deploying? So what happens basically is the first, well, it's waiting until that very last thing that happens there. So the launching, what it's going to do is it sends a request it communicates to all, it sends a signal to all of the processes that are running. It sends it a SIG term, and it gives it like 10 seconds to basically die, and if it doesn't, it already gives it a SIG kill, which is like a kill dash die. So you mean while it's loading the new application, it, it's still running the old one that you had a few minutes ago? Yes. So can you, uh, so the, potentially that means that my whole site's down for a few seconds in there, right? Like, can, I, can I say take down half? Or yeah, so actually, if you have, so basically what happens is it's, it's, it's down in the, for the time that it takes to download the slug of your app, which is like less than half a second. Uh, it holds the request for you. It doesn't like not respond. It just holds it for a second. But there, there is a, yeah, for very, very serious people, there is a, um, a flag that if you email us, they'll turn on for you, and it like, gives it a minute, basically. To, it'll like, hold the old one for a minute. And do that. And that's great for like super production worthy stuff, and most developers can find that really frustrating. Okay. Okay. 
Um, so let me do that again. Yes, we're running nine. Um, so the really fun thing you can do here, you can just do like scale that equals 100, right? And now we have 100 instances of the application running instantly, which is like the coolest thing ever. Uh, I love that. Because like these don't have to be web processes either. They could be like things that are scraping the internet and doing all your crazy, evil, dirty work. <laughs> My so own Bitcoin. Then, no, don't do that. So the net goes to the IPs per instance. Um, say it again. In other words, are all these instances sharing the same IP? Uh, no, well, so it's all behind a private network. So it's yeah, all so internal. Like, like it's yeah. Okay. And there's a there's a bunch of load balancers you can use. If you you CNAME to the um, not to an IP, you just do a CNAME to the URL of your application, and it'll automatically do it. Okay. If you add SSL, it does all that stuff too. If you now did, for example, scale web equals five, would it get rid of the other 95? Yeah, and yeah, so let's, uh, let's do a PS so we can see all 100. Remember, each of these are basically a 512 megabyte virtual server. So it's like a lot of, like no website anyone in this room probably makes would ever need that many. But I could. I run this many for fun, because I can. <laughs> like, that's a lot of servers. So, like, you can, you can get a lot of throughput with that. Um, so, let's do scale web equals three. That's much more reasonable. And then, now there's only three running. And it's just that easy. So, doing that all on an infrastructure as a service could make a lot of engineering effort. And if you're using, like, a, uh, AWS, which is great, um, there's a lot of nuances and like dodges that you kind of experience as you're using it. Like on AWS, um, machines will randomly just not respond at all, or they'll just disappear, even though it says that they're there. So like we engineer all that stuff away from it because it would be pretty hard to do otherwise. I saw another question. Um, how does the concept of instances of process map to like dynos? Are they like interchangeable the same? Uh, like so basically, the declaration of a process is a dyno. So in, the things that are in the proc file are in a dyno. And a dyno is a file that makes it around. You can, inside of that process, have multiple sub-processes. And we don't care about that at all. So with like Unicorn, I can tell it to run eight workers. Yeah, let's do that, actually. That would be fun. Um, and it'll do that. Uh, let's see. Slash w, let's do four. Django uses a lot of memory, a lot of RAM, unfortunately. If it was a class gap, I'd do eight. Four workers. So now we're going to actually basically quadruple the amount of throughput we get, uh, assuming the database is not really more than one database. That's not another question. Well, this is a question. Yes? Um, what's the best way to figure out how many uh, web servers to use? Is there a way to scale that automatically? Uh, there is not a way to scale it automatically, and that's mostly because every single app need has different needs. Um, and a lot of services like App Engine do that, and it makes billing very mysterious for people, which is annoying. Uh, yeah, they don't know what their charges are going to be at the end of the month. So there's two different things that I recommend. One of them is there's a really great iPhone app called Izumi that you can use, and it like, gives you a little slider that you can do anywhere. You know, if you're in a cab or something, you can scale up the processes. <laughs> which I do on a regular basis. It's a cab. Um, or uh, there. There's an API, basically. All this stuff is just interacting with an HTTP API, and it's a Python client. And uh, if you give, if your app is insightful enough to understand its need, uh, there's like some HTTP, HTTP headers that come in, and it'll tell you like what the load is, um, and, the lo and it's in the logs as well. It'll tell you what the, the load balance is. Or, yeah, load balance is what I order. Yes, system load balance. And it'll, um, and there's, there's someone, I think it's called Firebase, uh, or Higher Fire, yeah. No, that's not it. I have to look. There's this uh, web, there's like a service that does this. They just, well, here's one. It's not the one I'm looking for. Uh, but basically, like, there, there's companies that do this for you. And you just give access to your apps, and it'll scale them up for you. Once you install their plugin. So, uh, I, but, you know, that's not something that we offer. So, if you get a crazy bill, it's not, not our fault. <laughs> <laughs> I don't endorse the use of those, but for some people, they work really well. Yeah. I think I think the most called, it's not higher fire. It's like Firebase or something, something like that. I don't know. Yeah. So where did you get these things? Yes. Uh, let's get back to that. Um, so where were we? Oh, we. Let's make sure this works. Cool. 
So basically, um, let me go back to the slides. So you guys understand, does everyone understand what a dyno is? It's like this isolated virtual ephemeral database, basically, or virtual machine. And it's cool because you can like download a bunch of data into it. Um, and again, it's isolated, it's ephemeral, and it's going to go, like every 24 hours, the dyno restarts automatically, and everything, uh, you know, all the persistent changes that were on the disk are gone. But you can like use that to store temporary files and upload them to S3 or, or something like that. Uh, we'll through scaling. Oh, I'll show you the little part. Um, remind me to show you how to run Bash in a minute. So basically, to answer your question, um, we offer a bunch of additional services. So like I said, we don't have, there's no disk persistence in a dyno, right? Like every time it restarts, it's all gone. You're not going to run a database server on that. It would be ridiculous. Unless it's MongoDB. Oh, come on. <laughs> all right, so we have, um, so basically these are external services that are offered, some, some of them are offered by us, some of them are offered by third parties, and they are called uh, add-ons. And so we have like two mem, we have a couple of memcache providers, Redis, Mongo, um, SendGrid, and things like that for sending email. Um, you have New Relic for app performance, and you guys are all Django developers, so Sentry, for example, is a hosted service by uh, uh, on getsentry.com, that's really great. So you don't have to like run your own Sentry service. It's just like one command to set it up, basically. And uh, Heroku Postgres is one of those services. Uh, and the way it works is, I'll show you. You have add-ons for your app. So if you look now, it knew it was a Django app, so it automatically gave it a database, basically. So we can add, let's say we want to add Redis to the application. Uh, one is called Open Redis. Yeah, I'll do rest to go. And basically, what's happening is it's uh, it's just going out. It's telling the people that run the Redis to go service, I want a Redis server, and it's t it's just getting the URL for your credential back and it's putting it into your application. So you have Heroku add-ons. Uh, there's two of them available now. There's Heroku Postgres and there's Redis to go. And if you go here, Heroku config. Basically what this is, is a system for um, setting keys and values for your application. So we believe very heavily that if you're deploying your application in multiple environments, like locally, to staging, to production, you shouldn't have to edit code every time you're doing that. The code should stay the same, and like the metadata, or the parameters for the runtime should be changing. And we do those through environment variables. And Heroku config is a way to set, and set environment variables for your app. So, um, because the screen's small, it looks a little weird here, but you'll see there, there are three things to find here. Um, and these are these are environment variables that are available to the application. You have database URL, and like the more canonical version of that, and then there's the Go URL, and that is what just was sent back from that server. So now, the application can read this URL, you know, this Redis to Go URL from the environment, uh, and then it can connect to it and do whatever it wants, and it's totally separate resource that's being consumed. Yes. I believe, I mean, I believe I read somewhere that Heroku is running on the AWS backend, right? Correct. Now, do you guarantee that these services that you grab as add-ons are in the same availability zones and such, or? We do not uh, require that they do be, but we heavily, heavily encourage them to. So majority of them are going to be in, in, the, in the same data center in the U.S. East. To maintain like a, a standard base latency that we can rely on as developers that yeah, well, were Basically, we do, wouldn't accept someone into the add-on program if the service wasn't going to be good because we have we hold ourselves up to a very high standard. Uh, and the add-ons, you know, that actually makes them like partners in what we're offering. So they, uh, you know, if someone's going to do something improperly, then that's not we don't allow that. Um, so we just launched in in Europe, uh, and now there are certain add-ons that are available in certain regions. Mm -hmm. It's a new thing. So now it'll show you if it, like if you try to add like Reds to go. And I don't, I, they're probably in Europe, but let's say they're not, it wouldn't let you because it's, you know, you don't want to cross the Atlantic every time. That'd be ridiculous. So you do restrict by at least by region. At yeah. This point. Yeah, that's so what we... So like US East 1 data center and Reds to go is only available in US West 2, I'm not going to... But it probably depends on the add-on too, because like not all of them are probably <coughs> latency related. I'd say most of them are, but I can think of a few that I wouldn't be. Um, SMTP probably, if you can send that in a background job, mm -hmm. people normally do, it probably doesn't need to be 
but I'm just making it up. I mean, I don't, I'm not sure. Okay. Does um, so that give you a good, good idea? Yeah. Yeah. So, but Heroku Postgres is an add-on that is run by us, basically, instead of as from a third party. And it's, uh, it's people consider it the best Postgres um, service in the world, at least as a whole. <laughs> no, it's really, really great. We have, um, we fund like a lot of Postgres development. Um, I think we, I think we are responsible for a lot of the core features that have been added, like a PLD8 and stuff like that. I think that's a lot. I think we have a lot to do with that. Um, and this is our different database offering here. So we have this is like basically, and it gets pretty expensive for the serious one. But these are like crazy database servers. Like you should never need these unless you're doing, you know, eight, 68 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and you go down here. When I started, it was actually kind of upset because this was the base production version server, and now we have all the way down to Crane, which is only fifty dollars a month, which is much more palatable than two hundred. Yes. If I'm already on Amazon, could I use Post uh, Roku's Postgres as a service? With yes. Apple? Yeah, it's something that a lot of people don't know is like this is the, the Postgres offering is totally available from anywhere. You don't have to. You could be. I'm actually when I did manage.py. Sync TV locally, I was actually connecting to a Heroku Postgres database because I didn't want to, uh, to set it up locally. Uh, <laughs> I'm lazy. But yeah, it's, uh, so you can use them from anywhere. And this, this interface here actually is, um, is separate from the rest of it. So you can only have an account here and use databases. And we also have a bunch of lower tiers that are considered production ready. So we have a shared database plan, basically. We have one that's free and it gives you, I think, up to 10,000 rows in the database for free. And then we have one that's 10 million rows, and I think it's 10 or 20 dollars a month. So you can get pretty far with that. But again, it's not. There's like certain SLAs that we. I think we have like five or four nines of reliability, um, or about time with the Postgres um, production plans. But the shared ones are a bit lower. They, they chop off like half the nines, basically. <laughs> that's another question. Yeah. <coughs> If I remember right, I saw something earlier before I came here that the, the, dyno, the number of dynos, the number of I think instances are also related to the, the cost. Yes. Using the scale web equals whatever, is that changing that or is that changing yes. something else? Yeah, that, so basically what we do is we charge five cents per dyno hour. So every hour that one of those dynos is running, I think we were running 100, and it's charging five cents. And it's prorated to the second. So um, like you could spin up 100, and then one minute later go down to zero. And it's uh, you know it doesn't trigger that whole hour. It's charging me for that. So if you just have the free dev account. What can you do with that? Can you do anything with that, or is it just? Yeah. So the really cool thing about the dev account, or basically every app that you create on us gets uh, 750 free hours, uh, which is basically one process being up for the whole month. Um, and that's not for the account. It's for every app. So you could have you know eight or nine free apps that are all. It's basically like getting like nine free VPSs basically. What happens when you run out of that time? It just goes down or? What do you mean? You got 750 free hours, and then oh, well, then it just starts to bill you if you were to go over that. Yeah. Okay. So basically, that would happen if you were running more than one process. So. You deploy one of your apps from one of your free apps. Say it again. Could you deploy a new free app from one of your free apps? Uh, you could. Yeah, you could. <laughs> I wouldn't. Uh, so actually, I, that, the build pack party thing I was looking at earlier, all it did was it was like a app creator. It was kind of cool actually. I, I don't work on it anymore. But uh, the idea was like I'd set a get request and it would just like spin up a new app. Because uh, when you're hacking on on some of the stuff I hack on, like, having new apps a lot is really helpful. Uh, you could do that, yeah. But I would recommend it. <laughs> uh, yes. So, if you have dependencies that aren't in pip, like if you've written your own code, you know that's not like your Django app, but it's like your geo processing tool, yeah, or something, right? Like, how do you get that in your? Uh, so it depends a lot on what exactly you're doing. Usually, we recommend someone take a service-oriented approach. Um, so, you know, if you have something like that, it would probably run in a separate app. And then what you can do is you can use a build pack, we call them, uh, which is basically a set of shell scripts that allows you to. It's actually the mechanism we use to write support for a language. So, um, like when we added Python support, uh, basically we have a build pack that we write. And that's what to that's the absolute like that's the only thing that's required to add support for a language. And anyone can provide their own if they want, which is pretty cool. So I'll show you the Python one. Um, this is kind of this is one of the things I maintain. Um, 
and it's pretty simple. Basically, you know, it, it runs this uh, this shell script, and it, tell, it takes the two arguments, a build directory and a cache directory for like actually caching like your requirements and stuff. And then uh, I have a bunch of this is all my fancy bash skills. I learned a lot of bash when I started. It was fun. It's, it's oddly, it's like the weird language because it's so archaic. I feel like a hacker, like when I actually accomplish something. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> uh, like there's some crazy, like what does that even mean? I know what it means now. But like, it's so odd. It means is that directory present? Would you ever guess that ever? I don't know. Uh, so this is open source. Like anyone go and fork this and make their own modifications if they're not happy with the way we do the Python support, which obviously you wouldn't be unhappy with. But if you were, you wanted to do, if you had a weird dependency that we don't support, uh, like you know, say OpenCV or something like that, um, you could add support to that in here and basically like you know, have it download a tarball or something and then pull it locally. And uh, do the stuff, and a lot of people do that. So like some people want to run like Node.js commands before like in their build process if they're using some crazy Django um, Node.js like right. Yeah, you know, so like yeah. CSS. Yeah. So you could just like get clone additional things from private Git repos. Yeah. 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 We actually have a way. I mean, if you have Git submodules, we'll pull them automatically. Okay. But um, but yeah, like you could do anything you want yeah. in, in there. And, um, and then whenever you scale up then that build pack gets run. No, so it's only running when it's being built. So when you do the push, you saw that they have the best when it's being executed, and then it's frozen. Okay. And then when it's scaling up or down, it's all gotcha. portable. So uh, it's really cool though. So like you can write support for anything. So we have like a list of third party build packs. And people like there was the one for logo that I was showing you uh, beforehand, if you were here for the pre show demo. Like this is a build pack, right? Um, and I don't know how it works. Hey, let's go see if it's open source. Logo build pack. Hmm. Wow. That's why not. Well, I can show you. Huh? Give me a second. You guys can see something secret. Yeah, it's private. Why is that private? We should open source this. Uh, so yeah, let's see what's in the, in the compiled here. So. Well, it's like it's it's actually a Ruby app. It embeds the logo runtime by finding a, a .lgo file, and then it um, it's it, I think it's sticking an index.html file in there and has like a logo interpreter written in, in uh, JavaScript. So like this is like crazy. Like this has nothing to do with language support, obviously, but you can uh, it's basically it's a shell script that's run, so it's, it's pretty simple. And you can do a lot of cool things. Any questions about build packs? I was going to show the list of third party ones because we have that list of languages we support automatically that I showed you. Let me show you some things that communities have built. Um, common Lisp, C, Dart, Elixir, um, Erlang, GeoDjango. GeoDjango, that's a big one because um, that one has like, a lot of crazy fancies. Um, I'm working on that one, an Anaconda build pack, which would have support for SciPy and stuff. Um, I would like to support SciPy in the official one, but SciPy has some crazy, crazy fancies. It, it requires the Fortran extensions to GCC. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's definitely not something that I want to maintain. So, <laughs> um, Lua, JVM, like yeah, a lot of really cool stuff. Meteor, Kernel. We, we had someone that was working on a shell, shell build pack, and I have one called a null build pack. It just runs itself, basically. <laughs> there are fun things you can do. And uh, the cool thing about this is that other Platform providers. Like here's one for Sphinx that I wrote, and I love this one because all I do is I take like the re request repository or any project that I have with the docs directory, I just push it up with this build pack, and uh, I have an each. I just it builds the docs and it serves them up, and that's it. Like it's a really cool thing. Uh, if you don't want to read the docs for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm gonna alter it so that you can have a configuration for username and password, so you can like do private docs with it and stuff. But yeah. All right. Any questions about that? Awesome. Um, so we can go back to the config stuff. Um, so you know, these are all things that are provided by the add-ons that we added here. But you could have other things in here too, like debug equals one. You do config set. And basically, what's going to happen here is it adds it to the config. 
and it is debug equals one. And what it's going to do is it restarts every process that's running and it tells it to use these new environment variables. So I can do a cool thing I wanted to show you earlier, which is Heroku run bash. And we can run ls and stuff. You can actually run a full bash interpreter right in uh, Heroku run. And you know, we're just an interactive version of our app now. So you can like test things, like you want to install, you know, SciPy for whatever reason. Will it get know that this is persistent? Uh, yeah, it's not persistent, so it'll go away. It's only running in the uh, you know, as soon as you exit this comment. And it's isolated from all the other processes. Um, so you can do env, and you see all the environment variables in bash here, and there's a bunch of extra ones because it's an interactive shell but you'll see at the bottom there, debug equals one. And uh, some other ones that we set, you know, for Python, like the Python app, and Python uh, hash C. We don't want you to have uh, it's a new security feature in 273. For, um, I can't remember what they call it, I guess they call it a hash um, exploit of some sort. Collision? Speaking of versions, yes. which language versions do you support? So that's something that I released recently. It hasn't been like launched. It's, it's been shipped. It's out. It's in the documentation, but we haven't. Work, I'm working on like a big blog post to announce it to the world. Um, but I'm really excited about it. I can let me do it now. Runtime. I have this new file called runtime.txt, and uh, I, you can put any. I have like 40 different versions of Python available. So, uh, which is like so so much fun. So if I want to do like a very specific version, like 2.6.4, um, it'll, it'll work. Or you can do PyPy. Let's go move our application to PyPy. I don't think we have any dependencies that wouldn't work. It's not going to be, we'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it, I'm, I'm really excited about this actually. So I have a bunch of different versions. I have a repo up on GitHub. Um, go back here. Python versions. This is like little ver like mini version of a homebrew written in shell that I use for building Pythons. Um, and oops, that work. So here's all the different versions I have for them. <laughs> I, I went all the way back to two four four. Um, which is, I wanted to do older than that, but then they just like stopped building the Linux, modern Linux for some reason. I, I could get it. If you want to help me get it working, I will. Uh, you know, and so it, what did it do here? Is it source? So beforehand, it runs these other things, what are they called? The parts. So like every, all of them need SQLite, so it'll build SQLite for each one. And uh, you know, ideally, there's some other obscure library that I can use that into here, and it's available. Um, ah, see, PsychoPG. I think you need a special version of PsychoPG for, for PyPy. Uh, so that was rejected. So it failed because PyPy doesn't support PsychoPG 2 currently. Um, but the great part is our app is still running. And it's humming along. Um, but let's pretend that it did actually fail and broke. Um, let me do something here. I'll remove from the TXT. And let's make a breaking change to our application. Let's go to settings. You know, you, you hired a new intern, and he uh, has a syntax there, right? And he commits that. He pushes the production without running the tests, because you that's what you get for hiring unpaid labor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're going to push it up. And uh, again, it's doing exactly what we told it to do. So it's going to run this code. And it's going to not work. Uh, it'll take a second. And you know, so what would you normally do if you did this? In each system? Like, you'd have to you scramble. You have the pager alerts. You know, you can call the CEO. Your investors and our VCs are on the phone. Uh, it's on CNN. It's too bad it's down or something.
here for you. <laughs> understand kind of the, the whole kind of space around um, you've got a subdomain off of Heroku mm -hmm. um, and so is are we dealing with self-signed signatures then? No, you can, well you can't, I mean, I don't know if it'll let you install a self-signed, I guess it should. Uh, but, I'm just trying to remember because I, I don't know, I mean, do, does, so I'll show you. you get, okay. Um, so by default, uh, basically, you know, your app is available at http colon slash slash, yeah. uh, you switch to HTTPS and it's on the Heroku app domain. Uh, it'll, it'll, you know, it's called piggyback, and it's just going to work perfectly. Although, I just pushed breaking changes, so that's going to happen. So let me get back to this. Um, yeah. So breaking changes. Oh, no. Everything's, cool. like, this is the worst situation ever, right? Uh, I don't know why it's going with that. I think so. I'm going with SSL here. Yeah. I, see, I'm going through this proxy service. I'm going to disconnect from that. I guess it's causing the problem. This is still working. That's a restart Chrome. Cloak, by the way, it's really great. It causes some bugs sometimes. It's uh, I, when I'm traveling a lot, I, I, it's like the best thing ever. Cloak. Yeah, I get cloak. It's just it's for OS X only. Um, but basically, it's a little VPN thing. It just like sends all your traffic when you're on an unencrypted network. Um, and the cool thing is like for out of the states, it like will still make still make things think you're in the US. So cool. kind of cool. <coughs> anyway, so, um, you know, it broke, right? So we have this thing called Heroku Releases, which is awesome. And basically what it does is every time you make any change to your code base or you make a configuration change, um, it's creating a new release of your application. Each of those has a permanent number that's sequential. So, you know, us adding the debug config was a change in configuration, which changes the runtime. So therefore, there's a new release, and it bumps it up to version 10. And we, uh, this is us doing, um, what did we do a minute ago? Oh, that was us doing PyPy. And then this is us pushing with our, our trunk intern, posting, you know, uh, breaking our app. So the cool thing here is that we can roll back to any version at any time. So you can do Heroku rollback. And we can specify a version or not. If you don't, we just does the last one. And it creates a new release. Oh, here. That's proper. So now I do releases again. It's a new new feature. I haven't seen that before. Um, and now there's a new one called version 13, which was a rollback to version 11, which was before we pushed the breaking change. And now the site uh, is. Maybe I did. Maybe you did more than one. Oh, I pushed twice, didn't I? That's what happened. Yeah, let them call this statement. Maybe it will be 10. And now the app will be up again. Let's do this. Come on, Django, we can do it. All right. Yay. That's probably because I'm switching networks and crazy stuff. Why? Canceled. Is that even me? Did we cancel that one? You know what? I bet because we did debug equals one. HTTPS. Oh, oh, you're yeah, right. That's weird. Oh, you know, that's a, that's a new Django thing. I say it's because I have, it's like a really crappy demo app. But anyway, yeah, so back up now it's working. Um, which is pretty awesome. So like, if someone changes the config, like, you can always go back to an old one. And uh, you know, they get a lot of peace of mind with that. As long as that you keep that dino going. Um, no, what do you mean? In other words, the, the, when you close your dino, that then all, all, all your, your storage or your local that goes oh, right. correct. Yeah, but the, this, um, these are snapshots of your application. They're right. separate from local disk persistence. These okay. are like, they call them slugs, all right. basically. And it's like, basically, imagine like being an ISO of your app. And uh, we, keep, we keep those. So I can, I if we scale 1 equals 0, and it'll stop responding because we're running 0 now. Uh, and these releases are all, all there. Because these are, Basically, so the, the changes that build are persistent, but not the changes that are on top. Does that make sense? Yep. OK. Um, yeah, so do I roll back again? That's because I have zero when I'm running. That's not right. I will run one. 
So yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I think that covered most of them. Let me double check. Yeah, I did. So um, fire away. I'll create questions. Yes. You can have a remedial Heroku class. A uh, remedial Heroku class. Uh, well, I'll be having. We'll be controlling beer over at Hall, So you can ask me. Great <laughs> question. <laughs> you can feel. Well, what, what are you? Um, no, I just. I, I have a problem with the uh, background process of reading the the, um, the queue. Hmm. I yeah, I can definitely help you out with that. After if we, uh, yeah, if we have a response, we'll do it. You need to try contacting support. Uh, contacting so the support team. Support? No, I didn't. Uh, you can definitely do that, but if, if we have a time, I'd be more than happy to help. Yes. I'm um, talking about config and environment and environmental like variables. Mm -hmm. So essentially, like when using Heroku, what I normally do is I put my um, Twitter keys inside the environmental config variables. Is that yes. the correct way? That is. And um, can you only do it from the command line, or can you like set everything up in a file that you can like read it to like the environmental variables? Well, no. So basically, um, are you talking about for local or for for production? Um, for for deployment. deployment. Yeah, for deployment. So, um, and you could put them in a file and have it read the, and commit that file, but that kind of defeats the purpose of what we're trying to accomplish. Basically, the idea is you want your code to, you know, if someone gets access to your code, it shouldn't compromise your data. There you go. Um, so, we want everyone to put everything into environment variables and use the Heroku config thing. Well, I guess what I meant is that is there like an easy way to do it, like similar to Holler and use it like requirements dash R? In order to copy everything from the requirements into, um, you know, like earlier where you had the requirements of text, mm -hmm. you that little trick where you had the dash R. Yeah. In order for it to like automatically go out and like hit install everything. Yes. Yes. Oh, and you want to do that with a when you're setting environment variables for a new app. Yes. Yeah. So you can set more than one at a time. Okay. Uh, and I, I don't know if there is actually someone did build something. I think it's called Heroku M by David Dollar. Uh, let me see. Is that? Yeah. There's here it is, or we can take. Uh, this guy wrote it and it syncs a uh, syncs a local config into a .env file. And that um keeps them up to date. So if you change one, change the other. Okay. Um, but that's like you know, that's like a third party thing. He works for us, but it's like a thing he hacked in on the weekend. Uh, and actually auto I have this thing I wrote called auto env, which is really cool, which is really useful if you're doing this type of stuff. You guys might like it. Um, yeah, no. <laughs> um, basically what it does is it, if you have a .env file, uh, Foreman will automatically read the keys and values from the .env file. Um, so I have one here for the database I was using locally um, earlier, so it was in the environment. And what happens is with, when you install this thing called AutoEnv, it's a little evil. Um, basically, it overrides the CD command, uh, which I believe is a personal decision <laughs> that we all are allowed to make. Uh, tools like RVM, like all the Ruby developers use it, and it does that, and they don't know it, so I think it's bad. But this is very, I try to make this as you know, honest as possible. We all, there's no magic going on here. Um, so what happens is once you install it and everything, uh, this, there's this .env thing, right? And it'll do whatever you tell it to. So I guess tell it to, Echo high, and then you you authorize it the first time it caches it, and then every time you cd into the directory, it runs that command or that shell script. It's pretty cool. So you can have it um, work on two two two, and you can use it to activate virtual ends on. So it'll deactivate, right? And it's like a normal shell, and then we'll cd into Django to do. Oh well, you have to do it the first time. And now it's it's not activating. It. So deactivate again, go back, see Django to do, and actual end dot is activated, which is super super awesome. If you have me. Uh, uh, auto end. A U T O E N D. And I have a cool GIF. Oh, where is it? It's awesome. It's hosted on Akma, so maybe there it is. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so, yes. Yeah. When you were running Bash interactively before, uh, was that running on one of the dynos? It was. So basically, every new command is a new dyno. Okay. So then, if you're running interactively on one dyno, does that affect 
Can you affect your your running process by doing that? And, and in doing so, is I mean, is that limited to that one dyno, or does it <coughs> somehow expand to the, to the rest of them? It's, yeah, no. It's, it's so into the one. It's right? basically yeah, it's completely gelled into the one that you're running in. Um, you could th theoretically communicate with other dynos through your database or something like that, um, which is basically what you're doing when you're using Celery or Django, and it's just communicating to other processes with the database. But um, but no, there's no there there's no network access between them or disk access or anything else. Uh, then uh, we have this new thing that allows you to bind locally to to the loopback device. So I'm trying to figure out. I haven't tried it yet, but I think you could um, bind a server locally and then do an SSH reverse tunnel out. Um, <laughs> I, I really want to try it. I need to. I need to sit down and do it. So I think you, there is ways that you could get around it. But yeah, you have to get creative. Uh, is there a question back there? Yeah, could you talk a little bit about how you guys actually built on uh, AWS and abstracted away some of the kitty unresponsiveness and things just you know, stop responding? This, uh, well, so I'm actually not really involved with the the runtime team myself. Uh, I'm aware of the, the mechanism. Is that kind of what you're interested Yeah, that's in? kind of what I'm getting at, how you actually go about doing that. So, so basically, um, the thing that we really trust in the world is S3. Um, it's basically the most reliable data service ever created. Uh, it has nine nines of reliability. Uh, it's like more, you know, if you have like a team of ten people constantly changing data drives and archiving them, it's usually less uh, redundant than S3. Because <laughs> like, you know, if the East Coast goes out, it's still replicated in two other places around the world with S3. It's amazing. So um, every time, everything that's persistent on us is, is actually in S3. So when you do a git push, Really, we have like a tarball of your Git repo on S3. We're fetching it to a runtime, making the changes, and pushing it back up. Same with your application with the um, with the slugs that are run. And if you're with the Postgres service, they continually stream the wall logs, the write ahead logs for Postgres up to S3 as well. So if um, you know if EC2 is to the, the system that your server is on is to stop responding, you'll have up to like the last two seconds of your data. You, you know even if it hasn't been snapshot, which is super awesome. And uh, if you run Postgres yourself and you don't want to use our service for whatever reason, um, <coughs> there's Wally, we open sourced, and it's what we use to do the S3 streaming. Uh, and uh, like every every person who's doing serious Postgres stuff uses this, basically. It's, uh, it's pretty awesome. I don't use it myself because I just use the hosted version, because I don't like dealing with databases. But um, yeah, it's really, really nice. So, does that give you a good idea, kind of, of how things kind of work? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So, with multiple like instances of your servers, are there many of those to one like EC2 instance? Or? Yeah, yeah. So, like a dyno isn't one to one, um, uh, or you know, an EC2 instance. Basically, what happens is we have larger EC2 instances that uh, we run LFC containers on. Which give you, they're basically, they're kind of like greenlets for VMs, basically. They're much more inexpensive than a real VM. Um, and, you know, so they're, they're really nice for what we do. So you can, you can we run multiple dynos at one system, basically. And uh, they're all isolated from one another. And then the, the cool part is, like, if we, you, when you're building on us, you, ha you have the expectation that your process is going to restart once a day. Um, and that's like a <coughs> platform. So it's a good constraint because it teaches you to you know not rely on like you know long-term persistence and memory and stuff. And uh, if an EC2 instance goes down that your thing is running on, you can just move it somewhere else, and it's a new process that started. And um, you know, your you as a user are all there. It doesn't it doesn't matter to you where it's running as long as it's running. So yeah. So for when, when you're doing like dev staging production, right? Like, do you have different Heroku apps for your staging versus your production then? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what you would do basically is you do Heroku create again. And then when we do git remote, well, it didn't add it. So we can take this git URL, right? Mm -hmm. And we'll add it as staging. And we'll do git push staging master. You know, and there's a separate app now. Mm -hmm. And they're just in get, get URL. And, and when 
uh, you hit your 24 hour and it restarts the, uh, the node, like if a user has just uploaded a file to uh, that server, then is that file lost? If you just happen to hit it at the like snap if you site. if you do happen to hit it at the exact moment that you're starting and any disk persistence is gone, usually we recommend people. S3 supports this thing called direct to S3 uploads that we usually recommend people do because we also blo um, block new connections after that are longer than 30 seconds. Um, so that doesn't really work for a lot of people to upload. Right. So we re recommend people uh, upload straight to S3. There's a nice API to do that where it's kind of like. Um, public keys type of thing where you just like you can drop things in but not read them out and you can do it right from the web browser so that's usually what we recommend cool yeah and if you, you can get really evil you guys promise to tell me buddy <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, have you guys heard of the archive team it's pretty awesome basically like internet sites go down and it's a big deal and it sucks because sometimes there's like you know memories and people's like livelihoods that they put into these sites. Like so GeoCities went down for example. Uh, the most recent one was Posterous. So I, you know, so Posterous is shut down. They're still they said they were gonna shut down a couple weeks ago, they're still running. Um, but the archive team uh, basically goes out and we download everything before it gets shut down for, for historical reasons and for archiving. So like I run and downloaded um, is 3.5 terabytes of, of Postgres. Uh, it was all you know running in Dynamics because you just like run a scraper and you tell it to do its stuff, and you can just say run 500 of these and it does it. And like doing that on, this, on uh, AWS would have been pretty fun. Um, yeah. So you normally you see a bunch of K's here, but I stopped after a while. But yeah, it's pretty fun. If you, this is the blue line to me. Yeah, this is the leaderboard. But anyway. <laughs> So you can use it for non-web stuff too, is basically what I'm trying to say. You can use it for, for anything. Uh, and that's something that a lot of people don't realize because it's not, it's not marketed that way. We're only kind of marketing ourselves and positioning ourselves to web developers, but if you're doing like anything serious with Python at all, it should be pretty useful to you. Anybody else? Yes? Um, the question I have to ask, I have is, um, when you're working on a, a broker app and you deploy it, Mm -hmm. It gives you one of those names like Lowland something something. Yes. But what you want to do is that like overwrite or really play your app like like you maybe make some changes locally and change which one like blow away everything on Heroku but still keep the same like um, URL. Like, is there a way to do that? Oh, well, you could just do a get force push, okay. um, but I wouldn't recommend that because it's going to use the same cache. Um, so normally you would rename your app and then have another one that you rename to the new to the old name. And that should work on. Okay, so I like rename it. So I can just rename my new app to like the old name. Yeah, basically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh, and you were asking about SSL earlier. I forgot. Um, basically, um, like this is a service I run, and it is it has. Let me show you. What is it? Just dig. I'll show you the. Uh, that doesn't tell you does it. It only tells you for www. <coughs> yeah. So um, basically, um, you have CN to the, the service, and then the server, you know, it, you, you take your certificate like you would with any web server, and we have this thing. I'll, I'll go to the app and show you. Hopefully, I won't say secret keys or anything. We'll find out. I'll uh, repose public HTTP then. Um, or a boost service, I think it's called. Um, um, and this is my app. So basically, you, we, we create an endpoint for you for SSL, and you like give it your certs. Um, let's see if it'll give me. Um, let's try this. Yeah, so basically, like, I just I, I, I have all the files like here, like CA certain key, and I, I basically ran a command to upload it, and they verify that it all works, and then it'll respond to the request from that. It's pretty simple. And that's way better than configuring, you know, Nginx or Apache yourself with yes. so that's, that's not fun. <laughs> At least for me. Uh, yeah? So do people use Heroku for either big data or running a bunch of simula simulations in parallel or anything? 
Uh, not that I'm really aware of. The, the unfortunate um, constraint that we have right now is that, um, well, previously, um, every <coughs> process is limited to 512 megs of RAM, uh, which is not, it's good for parallel stuff, but not for you know, real big data. Um, now we have this thing called double dynos that we launched. And basically, it allows you to it gives you double RAM. Um, so ideally, if you ask me, in the future we would have n dynos that let you just say however much RAM you want. But um, uh, we'll see what happens. Uh, so currently, you know, when I do PS, um, oh, hang on, let me go back to the other one. Oh, now we have two apps. Sorry, this television one. So now it says 1x next to web there. Uh, and that is saying it's a, it's a single dyno, not a double dyno. So I can, I think I, I actually haven't done it before. Let's find out. Scale web equals to, wait. Let's try it. I think it's web equals to size equals 2x. I think that'll do it. Uh, no, I have to look. Well, I'm already on the page. But yeah, that would give it double the amount of RAM. So ideally, in the future, you know, I want dynos with 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, but that's not the case today. Oh, OK, so I do PSV size. So I tell it to resize web to 2x. And now instead of 512 megs of RAM, it'll have, um, it'll have a gig, which doubles the price. But, uh, but yeah, so I think like it's, it's pretty awesome. Uh, I saw another hand somewhere. Yeah. So for web stuff, like, is does it? When, when would it not make sense to do something on Heroku? Hmm. Um, I think it. The biggest one is when you have custom services that are running. So a big constraint on us is that you can only uh, incoming connections can only be HTTP. You can't be TCP. Uh, so if you're running a you know, SMTP server. Or other things like that, uh, or like you know, you know, if you're doing some like more fancy like zero zero RPC and like zero MQ stuff, uh, services like that don't really run well on us. But if you do that, I think if you do that SSH thing I was talking about with the tunneling, you could get around it, uh, which I'm really excited about. So you know, but I wouldn't re I wouldn't rely on that for serious stuff. That'd be a bad idea. Yeah. Can you set it to scale automatically? No. So there, there are people that build services that allow you to do that. Um, they, they're third parties that make things that do that. Because uh, you can interact with the API. I'll show you Heroku.py I wrote. Um, and basically what it does, it's just a wrapper around the Heroku API, basically. So you can give it your key and then your list of apps, and you can just tell it to scale up and down from there. So if your app is smart enough to know what it needs, you can have it do it through this. Um, that would be the, the proper solution. Moment. Yeah. How are you doing in static files on that app? Uh, so on that app, I'm just kind of doing whatever Django does by default. I think it's in debug mode and it's doing um, it's doing the, the, the default static file serving. Right. What's the best way when you get off of that? Um, so two things. I think that I believe personally that static resources aren't that different than dynamic ones. And for most websites, most small ones, most apps that you know the average developer would make, serving um, Serving them from the application is not is perfectly fine. Um, and, and Django kind of instills the opposite belief in a lot of people, and I, I think that's a good stance for Django to take because you know there's security implications and things like that. But uh, it's definitely something that I believe pretty strongly in. And a lot of other like, like Django is the only um, a ecosystem that believes that. All the other, other languages they don't care. Um, when you move from that, normally there's this the next step when you're on your own server is to move to nginx. Um, you know, have that front it, and then you have you know, tremendously fast, and uh, Python isn't getting any load for the static files. Um, you don't run Nginx on us, so there's a third step that you normally take when you're on your own system and your own setup, which would be moving to a CDN. So uh, for us, you go straight from one to three, basically. You would, uh, you know, go push your stuff to S3 or cloud files or um, Fastly or something like that, and uh, that's that's. Basically, the best recommendation. Does that make sense? Yeah. And at, at cloud, um, what's it called? It's not cloud file. That's 
platform, yeah. They just did this new thing where if you set the TTL to zero, it will reverse proxy your app, kind of like Varnish does uh, for dynamic requests. And then if there are headers that are present for caching, then it will honor them. Uh, so you can you could just have your application serve them, and then have a proxy in front of it and have it do both uh, at the same time, which is kind of cool. But um, you know, it depends on your needs and everything. Does it close the CF? Um, does does uh, CloudFront? No, I'm just saying CloudFront, that new dynamic caching type doesn't handle posts yet. So I'm, I'm not sure. sure. I, haven't, uh, I haven't used it myself. Oh, are you telling me it doesn't? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. It doesn't handle post? Yeah, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, that would surprise me. So, and that's the other thing too, is it doesn't support SSL either. Um, your custom SSL, so you would you probably do like a subdomain, like, you know, assets.iapp.com. Wow, I guess that means I've been talking for too long. <laughs> uh, so, last opportunity for any questions? Yeah. Could, could you just talk about uh, the development team behind this? Like, yeah. how big, how are you guys split up? Or how do you work together? Uh, so, we're uh, about, I'm trying to remember, we're, I think we're at about, we're close to 100 employees. You might be a little over or a little under right now. Um, we are well, part of developers. Developers? Let me think. I don't have a hard number. I would guess between 50 and 60. So. Okay. Um, we're a very largely engineer-driven organization, uh, and uh, if you count sales, I'm trying to think of who isn't an engineer. We have, we do have some sales guys and some like that. I, we probably have 20 people that aren't engineers in total, um, and we work. Uh, I like I live in Virginia. I work remotely. The office is in San Francisco. Uh, we are a white combinator company that got acquired by Salesforce, and uh, we are the only acquisition, as far as I know that is allowed to operate uh, kind of autonomous, autonomously. Autonomous. And how, how, how big are your teams? And uh, it depends a lot on what's going on, but usually we have smaller teams, so like three or four people. I think the routing team is like three people. Um, I am the Python team, so it's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Although we just hired Jacob Papamas, which we're really, really excited about. Um, he's going to be our new head of platform security, and he's going to be helping me a lot with Python stuff too. And then we have this guy named Reese. Ellsmore out of Australia. I met Python AU, and he's on a support team now. So we're starting to get a little Python, a uh, little team going, uh, which is fun. And there's a Ruby team, and there's a routing team, and a platform team, and a foundation team, and lots of teams. The old and packaging team. And then do teams uh, have a formal manager or technique slash engineer? Like what's so it depends a lot on um, what's the culture on the team that. Uh, <coughs> Each team can kind of pick what works best for them, but uh, usually they have a manager. Each team has a manager, and uh, but that can mean one of two things: there's both there's product managers and people managers, and often they're the same people, often they're not. Kind of depends. Um, I kind of like Python stuff. I like being my own team because then I am the product manager. You know, and I, I get to I don't have to argue a lot of the decisions that I want to make, um, which is great. But you know, for a lot of people, uh, it's a lot more. It, it really depends on the team. And some teams are remote, uh, a lot of remote people. Some of them are all people in the office. So like the uh, core engineering team that's like working on all the dyno stuff, like they're all in the office. So they probably wouldn't hire someone for that role to be remote. But the support engineers, they're all remote. Uh, Python's all remote. All the evangelists are remote. Uh, so it, it varies very greatly on the, on the team, I'd say. It's a pretty great culture too. We were featured in like uh, Wired recently. We have these people called Vibe Managers, and they're basically like office managers, um, and they're like responsible for company culture. And their their job is basically to make all the employees' lives really easy. So like it's really great. And we have, like cater lunch every day and stuff, and it's, it's nice. Although I don't get to I miss out on that because I'm out you know in the boonies, but it's it's nice. It's a great company, and we're hiring. So uh, I it's seriously actually the best place I've ever worked. Um, let me show you the jobs page. I don't, know I don't know what we're hiring for right now. It changes all the time. Oh, we have a bunch of them now. Sweet. Uh, hey, so some people are looking for for vibe engineers. Um, well, what's with the samurai theme, like thing? The, so uh, basically, all of our branding is, is Japanese. So Heroku is a made-up Japanese word. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the story is that it, it's a. Uh, uh, it's really funny. Our COO says on interviews that it's a combination of the word uh, hero and haiku. 
But then I've also been told that that's bullshit, so <laughs> I'm not sure which one's true. But like on my business card, we got like the crane, and I have the koi on the back. Yeah, I don't know. And then if you go to the databases, um, uh, they're all like, you know, this is very much our theme is is, uh, is Japanese stuff. So like, uh, we just did Waza, which is our big Heroku conference in San Francisco. I, I was in charge of all the content, and it was called um, it was called Waza, which is like art and technique in Japanese. And like, and here are all the different database plans. So they're all, you know, different Japanese uh, things. The mecha, we wanted to call this Voltron, but um, there's like <laughs> trademark issues. <laughs> and, and that one's Zilla, not Godzilla. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. So aside from the obvious, when you think about growing the Python team, mm -hmm. what skills are you thinking of? Um, I don't know. So I don't think no, we actually need more people on the Python team at this point. I think I think it would be more like an internal team. Uh, potentially, where like other people that are already doing Python, although we hire that, like Jacob isn't, uh, he's not being hired for the Python team, he's hired for the Toledo security team. But obviously, he has very, you know, his skills are very valuable for the Python team, so he'll be, you know, it's, it, like there, so there are two different types of teams basically. There's like primary teams and then like secondary teams, kind of, where like, like you have a team that's like why you're hired, and that's your role in the company, and you know, there's like other teams that you can be on that are like a part okay, of Okay, now I get it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and like at the moment it's kind of unclear if the Python would be one or the other. Um, I will see. <laughs> Does that make sense? I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But um I don't know, it depends. Look so that stuff would be here whenever that's decided basically. <laughs> yeah. Um and it's yeah so we're also very like system engineer oriented a lot so it, um, most people that like we do a lot of Ruby internally, but we're also very um, uh, distributed uh, services basically. Like Heroku is actually comprised of you know like a hundred different services that are running. And if you go to like the dashboard, which I should have showed you actually, um, this is where you, this is like the web interface for all your apps basically instead of doing the command line. So before I forget, you do Heroku apps and it'll just list all my apps. I have a lot, so I'll take a little bit. Um, a lot of apps. <laughs> uh, so, that's cool. so this is you know the other interface. So I'll go to HTTP bin. Um, this whole thing here, right? This is like how a lot of people interact. They can scale up and down from here uh, and see releases and stuff, right? All those things that we saw on the command line. So um, this here is is a regular. It's literally a Heroku app. There's no special privileges at all. It's, it's running on the platform, just like any other user app is. So I can now Roku CO PS app dashboard. And you know, so there's the uh, process of running that that thing. So pretty awesome. And we like to. Uh, there's two ways to say it. One is less elegant than the other. Um, eat your own dog food or sip your own champagne. <laughs> Which is a lot nicer than the other. But um, yeah, it's, it's pretty great. Yes? I'm not sure if you mentioned um, performance. How is that on Heroku? Uh, so basically, you can about roughly estimate that a, a dyno will have the same performance as your average 512 megabyte VPS for the most part. Um, so that's actually okay. give you a pretty good idea. At what point do you start scaling? Um, well, when you when you're basically when your process can't handle um, any more requests at a time, so it depends on what you're doing. Like I can take Gevent with Python and Flask app, and I can get it to respond uh, at uh, 2,000 requests a second with one dyno, um, which is awesome. But if you have like, an average Django app and it's making a new database connection with every request, you know it um, it will take longer. So you'll need, well, might only be able to get, I'm just guessing, about 200 requests a second, right? So it depends on your application, basically. And you'll see, uh, if you look in your logs, like you'll, you'll see if there's a long wait time for, for your app to respond. And you'll, you know, you can, you can, we have this tool called New Relic. Um, it's, it's someone else, it's this company called New Relic that provides it. Anybody can use it, but it's uh, built in. There's, a, there's an add-on for us. So they used to, uh, and they have a lot of 
really great metrics on where your app is slow and it'll help you decide which is scale up and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, did you see, uh, I saw on Hacker News recently, uh, Adrian Holovati had a, a thing. Do you have a response to that? Like, uh, um, yeah, so basically, I f so do you want to say what his what was in his post? Uh, we, he had a post saying why I left Heroku. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, he hasn't been on Amazon, but yeah, Amazon long enough to say why I'm leaving Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> basically, that's my conclusion. Yeah, uh, so, well, basically, I feel like, um, we were a bad fit for, for Adrian, um, personally. Uh, now, he did run into one bug that was my fault personally. Um, there was uh, a long time ago. Basically, what happened was he pushed, um, he, he had a really crazy thing in his requirements file. Basically, it wasn't that crazy, but it, from the code perspective, it was. He had some commented out lines in his requirements file with like pros written in them. And then in one of those lines, it said dash R or something else. Um, and then I had this thing that was trying to like, cascade through, because you can do dash r in a requirements file, and it'll go to another file and keep going. So I was injecting those files into it in memory, to, and then it had a syntax there. Um, and you know, I fixed it 10 minutes later, once he told me about it. And he's the only person that ran into it, but it happened to be him. So that left the first bad taste in his mouth. Yeah, they all have problem setting up they all have yeah, I'm not, still not sure what his problem was with that because he told me the next day he just got working. He didn't know how. So, um, yeah, he's a, he's a really great guy, and it's um, been to see him go because I, I actually told him I was gonna I was offered to you know fly down to Chicago and try to figure things out. I was upset, but uh, he he's very happy with Amazon now, so I'm very happy. And it's definitely not a platform for everybody. Like he, I think he it sounded from the way his post was, he just didn't like the fact that he didn't understand it, right? And that's that's a um, that's a big problem. So ideally, all of our understand it, but um, so that's a failure on our part. But something that we're working to improve every day. So it's really good. Thank you for the response. That's cool. Yeah. Um, Check with you really? Yeah, this is what it is, and what yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. I don't use it as much as I should. Um, let me think of an app I have that uses it. Okay. Uses what? Uh, New Relic. So New Relic is they're really really great guys. Um, basically, it's a service that um, you run it, and it's like kind of like a little demon that runs within your app, uh, and it just like listens to everything in your Python process and uh, uploads all the data. So um, it knows when SQL queries are slow. It knows um, what what parts like what URLs. Like it'll say, it'll tell you where where like your average request is being slow. And for example, if it's in network I/O, it'll go through and it'll show you which different like domains are being looked up, and it'll show you which one's slowest. Um, it's it's really useful. That's not a service run by us, but we have a close partnership with them. We work with them a lot, and they help um, tremendously because you can like track memory usage and stuff with them, and um, you know request per second over time. And they go. So the reason I don't like them as much is because they, they take a very totalitarian uh, view of what they're doing. So if you install their Django thing, uh, it'll actually like inject JavaScript into your app. That will is really cool. <coughs> it'll actually like tell it'll tell you like the page load times for your users from the JavaScript side, which is awesome. But um, that's just not like the way I like to build things myself. I'm more of a you know, web services guy than a, uh, the other way around. But it's really cool. I recommend it. Think about that. Peter was at 0%. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. It said it had five hours left. Uh, oh, oh, it's probably because I was recording the screen. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Peter. Yeah. Do you want to close? Or? No, that's it. Great talk, man. Awesome. <laughs> all right. <laughs>